Divide and Conquer, published at the Outpost of Freedom on August 16th, 2009. In war, in battlefield combat, one of the most important strategies, especially if the enemy has superior numbers, is to divide and conquer. Very briefly, it can be explained that if you have a force of 3,000 and the enemy has a force of 4,000, you will probably be defeated in combat. However, if you can cause him to divide his forces into two groups, each having about 2,000 men, you have gone from 25% less men against his entire force to a 50% advantage over one of the divided forces. Once the first unit is defeated, the second unit can be attacked with much greater odds than if an attack was made on the entire force at the outset. The same is true of the psychological warfare America is embroiled in today and the political warfare that has begun to divide the country and our own patriot community. Here are just some of the singular objectives that are commonly pursued today. Politicking. Objective 1. Third parties, such as the American Party, the Constitutional Party, the Libertarian Party, and Christian Conservatives. In terms of any of these entities achieving any successful political advancement, they are little more than a social organization. Though it may feel good to be among people who think, like you, the ability to affect any change within the current political structure with a new party is non-existent. The problem is that the Congress has managed to manipulate the electoral and election processes to remove, or reduce to insignificance, the possibility of a challenging third party to achieve even a modicum of success. Objective 2. The Continental Congress. Now, the first Continental Congress was called for by the New York Committees of Safety. The other colonies responded, in kind, by agreeing to the Congress. The primary result was the Non-Importation Agreement, as well as some petitions, and most importantly, the understanding that the colonies could work together for a common goal. The delegates were either existing members of the respective legislatures who were not on the side of the royal government, or delegates selected by the various committees. This was true of the subsequent Continental Congresses as well. The Congresses were called for by the delegates, not the delegates being called for by the Congress. The current call for a Continental Congress is a small group, though admittedly growing, of people who have been called for delegates to their Congress. This could never be construed to be an emulation of those first Congresses. Since their line of representation is downward and selective, anything that they do or ask for is nothing more than any other group could do or ask for. It bears no weight and is not representative of the people or even a constituency. The problem is that we have been denied redress of grievances as guaranteed by the Constitution. In desperation, we are seeking ways to regain that right, but it will only come when the rebel U.S. government returns to its willingness to heed the will of the people, or the people return to implementing authority from the bottom, the people, to the top, the government. Objective 3 the Confederate States of America. This group of sincere patriots have endeavored to arise from the past. They have taken the mantle of those who, many years ago, tried to stop the then-beginning-to-grow element of congressional and presidential tyranny. Though secession was not considered unconstitutional when the New England states met in Hartford, Connecticut in 1814 and 1815, to, among other things, discuss secession, 
it was those same states that supported Lincoln in his claim that secession was unconstitutional. Therefore, the most damaging war in our history was conducted to prove that secession was unconstitutional. The precedents having been established, just how far do you think that you will get with the current effort? The problem is that the Congress and the executive have, in effect, revised the Constitution, effectively outlawing any attempt to remove oneself from the compact. Once in, you are stuck. There is no way out of the corrupted influence of government by secession. In reviewing these issues and realizing what the outcome of each will provide as a result, we can see that we are facing a myriad of tasks, none or few of which will result in more than a very singular solution to a very singular problem. If, after years of effort, a battle, which has been waged, is won, leaving no residual to encumber us into a continuation of that battle, we can then choose another battle to pursue. However, who is to believe that if a battle is won finally and decidedly, that another objective will not appear to take its place? The division of our forces is inherent in the struggle as we are pursuing it. Each, due to his personal ideology, has chosen one or another of the objectives and is willing to give 100%, not realizing the futility of even success in that battle once the battle is completed. Is there an alternative course that can achieve all of the objectives? If we were in a battlefield where an effort has been made to divide the forces, giving advantage to the enemy, we would, if our objective was to win and we had superior forces, refuse to divide our force. The enemy would have anticipated being successful in creating the division, as they most certainly believe to be the case, and would not anticipate an all-out attack on their main base, leaving them divided simply by believing that we were divided. In this psychological or political war that we are engaged in, what strategy would overcome the division that has given such an advantage to the enemy? Could it be to concentrate our forces on a single issue? Most assuredly, it would be unsuccessful, since, even though that battle may be won, it would only lead us to the next battle, and the next, and eventually, to defeat. Would we rather pay lip service to George Washington, or would we rather do that which is necessary to achieve the removal of a despotic government? He was willing to do what was necessary to expel those who resisted allowing freedom and liberty to prevail in the land. He supported those peaceful efforts when there was hope for them to succeed. When that hope was gone, though, he chose the only course that remained. When peaceful methods had convinced the Founding Fathers that they would be of no avail, the efforts were stepped up to force the hand of the despotic government. Surrender was not in their vocabulary. The desire of the despots to retain control was the force that was necessary to compel the colonists to risk all when all else had failed. We have tried petitions. We have tried demonstration. We have been ignored by those in power for every effort we have exerted. Perhaps now is the time to extend our efforts into physical effort. Create displeasure and discomfort for those in power and those who support them. In addition, we must be sincere and methodical, for if we fail in this effort, 
there remained but two choices, victory by force of arms or defeat by failure to be willing to fully commit to the cause.